Hello, hello, and uh, thank you for being here. Every single time I'm at this venue, it's just mind-blowing. The screen, the people, it's fantastic. Today, I want to tell you a story. And uh, this story started three years ago. In uh, 2019, I was on this very stage with a friend and a colleague of mine, Luca Mezzalira, and we were actually uh, talking the ideas and the reasoning from the zone that went into the creation of the micro front ends as we intended. So we presented the, our journey, the, the zone journey to micro front end, what we wanted to achieve, which were the reasons for the decisions that we made. And that talk has been huge for me personally, I really loved it, but also a lot of people came after to ask questions, to, to talk, oh, but I don't agree with this one, I would like to do this in a different way. So it clearly showed that something was uh, pretty much interesting, that some sparks were actually started in that talk. And that's why I said, okay, maybe we need to do um, a sequel of that talk, a volume two, because there are so many things that changed and quite a few things that didn't. So in this talk today, I'm gonna go through what we learned in the last three or four years, dealing with micro front ends every single day at scale. My name is Max, I'm a principal engineer at The Zone. Um, I've been in the UK, I'm based in London for uh, six years. I grew up in Rome, in Italy, and uh, you can find me on Twitter, underscore Max Gallo or maxgallo.io. Our story today starts with once upon a time, as all the great stories, right? And once upon a time is gonna help us setting the context for our talk and for everything that will come after. So how do we arrive to those decisions? Which were the context? I will repeat the word context 15 times, apologies, but it's very, very important. After we set up the context, the, the foundation for, uh, for moving forward, we're gonna go through the evolution of our decisions because our decisions are not immutable. They're not gonna stay there forever. We're gonna talk about domain boundaries, uh, subdomains, co bounded context, and we're gonna see how they evolved for us and what we learn from those evolutions. Then we're gonna move to team autonomy. Uh, we actually stressed out a lot the importance of team autonomy and with, along the years, we find out a couple of things that were actually very useful for us to pursue team, team autonomy, but also to make sure that it was implemented in the right way. And we were also offering possibility for teams to go beyond the team autonomy. And last but not least, sharing code. Uh, this is probably my, my, my favorite part of the talk because we're gonna see how some decisions that we took at the beginning were probably right, they didn't change, but there was an evolution on that. Are we sharing code? Are, what are we sharing across the micro front ends? We're gonna see that as the last part. Once upon a time, there was a company. Dazon is a live sports streaming company. Uh, we have offices in four places around Europe. One, in, one is in Amsterdam. Uh, we are uh, something like 200 countries where we are actually allowing our users to watch live sports on their mobile phone, on their TV, on their laptop. And uh, this one has been growing a lot. In 2017, uh, we were like three, four developers, something like that. Right now we are 500 in the engineering de department in total. So imagine exponential growth. Nowadays it's not as it used to be in terms of growth, so we kind of settle up a little bit, but you need to understand the context again, because we were optimizing for scale, we were optimizing for growth. So we were growing exponentially, and more importantly, we wanted our code, our architecture, to play along, to make sure it was supporting our growth. What we did, uh, we did spend some time thinking about how to split our monolith into what we called micro front ends. And that was something that we did, we started five years ago almost, and so we matured the idea. Uh, the whole concept is single responsibility of a code base works well if you have a single team or a couple of teams. When you start to have 10, 15 teams, it starts to get messy. You need to organize, you need to communicate. And that's how we started to split our front end. But micro front end is quite general. You can intend many things you can actually um, 
uh, you, you, you can include many different scenarios and kinds of micro frontends. So we push it further and we say, okay, this is our micro frontends manifesto. This is what we think is gonna help us with our specific context and our specific background. So we modeled our micro frontends around business domain. Imagine Dazon as a company, live sports streaming. Uh, of course, you can enter the app or enter the website and play some content, but there are also help pages, landing pages, the, the, there is a way to contact us, the customer support. So all of these, we identified them as subdomain, business subdomain. And each of those was a different micro frontend. So we had a completely implement independent implementation of these subdomains, and each of these were owned by separate teams. In this example, I've got catalog micro frontend owned by our lovely team A, and the landing page micro frontend owned by team B. The entire view was owned by one team. That was great. They live happily ever after. Nope. Why not? I really wanted to put this slide on this screen. Uh, because we are, in, uh, we are in an industry which evolves and changes. So if we think about oh, our code uh, will be there forever, and, and, and not, not even close, our code has an expiration date, and our code must reflect the company business, the business interest. Otherwise, we are selling code, which is not exactly what we sh we're supposed to, to do. So I want to talk about evolution. In this case, domain boundaries evolution. We briefly touch how we arrived to define those business subdomains and which were the boundaries. So in the definition of the boundaries, you start at a given point in time. Uh, that was three, four years ago. Dazon was in a specific state and the company was investing resources, uh, people, uh, money into certain areas. Is that the same structure identical as of nowadays? Not really. Can you, can you say that your company was exactly the same three, four years ago as it is right, right, right now? Most likely not. Maybe, I hope, yes, that will give you stability, but usually don't. So that means that the company is changing, the company is shifting priorities. So your architecture, your code must follow those de de decisions. Uh, so our division, our split of the domain boundaries had to be revisited because the business evolved. What we realized is that we can shrink, we can make these domain boundaries a little bit larger, sometimes smaller, and what we noticed is that in some cases there were some domain, some um, actual micro frontends, which were a little bit too big for what we like to be. How do we spot that out? Not that hard because there were three, four teams talking with each other constantly, doing release trains, um, creating some uh, channels uh, uh, for communicating outside of their team, normal, daily. And that I those are signs. Those are signs that will tell you, mm, okay, there are teams which are organizing by themselves, which is a splendid thing, it's fantastic. But as a company, as an organization, you need to think twice. Is that happening because we wanted to or because the actual teams are fighting back a certain architecture. In that case, we thought the teams were fighting back in a very polite way. They were not with axes and swords, but there were some, some sort of fight, of fight back. So we say, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. How do we define these boundaries? And we said, maybe we want to split those boundaries. We want to split those micro frontiers. We want to merge them. So changing the way we identify the boundaries has been key for us. And in the last three years, we actually did merge two micro frontends because a single team was owning both of them. And we said, ah, it doesn't make sense. They're working on two code bases. They are redoing the same thing. Let's merge them. Nice. In other cases, we split that. And uh, that was beautiful because the overall architecture didn't change. So there were certain um, ideas that did not change. But at some point, we hit a roadblock because in some cases, we were not able to go through fast enough to allow independent part of the UI to be autonomously de de deployed. This is quite a famous case for us, uh, is the catalog micro frontend, which holds the player inside it. Uh, some part of the UI, in this case the player, were actually considered uh, quite a lot in the company because we are a live stream sport company. So you need to focus on the player. There was not a team on the player, there is a department working on playback in general. 
So this is for us, if you read team topologies, is what we call a complex subsystem. So something which is quite complex, you need experts and you need someone to take care of that autonomously. They were taking care of that. We had multiple teams working on that. They were not autonomous. So we were like, okay, how do we make player team more autonomous? Can they release independently? No, because that was an NPM component. They had to coordinate with the vertical micro front end. So we need to take a step back and we need to consider vertical and horizontal. What the hell is vertical or horizontal micro front end? So, so far we talk about vertical micro front ends because they use the actual, uh, the entire view. So we've got a team A which is responsible for an entire view and team B which is responsible for another view. And these are vertical because they have everything. When you are on call, on support, you have one team responsible for your view. In the concept of horizontal micro front ends, you actually have multiple teams supporting the same view. That sounds similar, but also very different. In the concept of horizontal micro front end, you actually have teams which need to coordinate with each other about the layout, about certain shared libraries, which doesn't really happen on vertical. The important bit about the horizontal one is that still has in common some very nice uh, ideas behind Team A should be entitled to deploy independently as much as possible because I don't want to block that team with a release from another team. So we push it further and we say, okay, this is the theory, but what about the practice? How does that work for us? Uh, do we want to get rid of the vertical microphone test? Mm, not really. So we say, let's keep it that. Let's keep the vertical ones as an encapsulation, as a host, and let's have player and a few others as horizontal micro front end within the vertical one. So we've got two very different architecture playing to together to follow our business needs. How did we do that technically? Um, back then, uh, when we started this uh, model federation or single SPA were not really as popular. So we actually wrote our own uh, uh, abstraction over system.js, it's actually relatively easy. And uh, we are loading player at runtime, so these module here, this micro front end here, can be deployed autonomously. Can be deployed autonomously on always? Not always. Why not? Because you need to uh, make sure that you're not adding breaking changes. So there is some sort of connection between the host and the actual micro front end, the horizontal one inside it. So there is a high degree of freedom. Uh, the team can re re release new features, can release patches, can roll back. Roll back is huge. Before we had to coordinate three teams to roll back something from one team. That was a huge win. But at that point it was like, okay, this is probably good, good, good enough. And this was our redefinition of our boundaries into something quite different. And while redefining the boundaries, we actually, um, we actually went even further talking about team autonomy because we wanted to push for team autonomy so much that somehow we were at risk to create silos. What is a silo? A silo in a team is where your team doesn't communicate enough with teams outside or with team members or developers or other people in the company outside of their teams. Uh, you may not notice that it's not super easy to define is this team siloed or not. But we actually experienced a couple of things that were trying to keep the team as autonomous as possible, but keep the company as organized as possible. The first thing is shared knowledge across teams. We did several front-end guilds to give the opportunity to people to talk with each other outside of their team, maybe ab about, oh, Micro front -end team A is using a cool testing library. Maybe you should check, check it out because it helps you for X, Y, and Z. And those were organized things like once a month, once every two months. And also it's very important for all your individual contributors and generic roles which are across team to spot this team, to spot if two or three teams are trying to reinvent the wheel in so many places, especially if the wheel is very complex. If the wheel is not that complex, let's make them reinvent the wheel, why not? Next one is about decision. We want to favor local decision as much as possible, but we need to plan for global decision. I would love to work in a company where every single decision is at team level. I've never worked in such a company because it doesn't exist simply. We work with complex systems. We work with a complex environment that needs to be prepared for global de decision. We use request for comments, RFCs, or an following up decision records to keep track and to propose changes. If 
you probably have used request for comments in the past, in the past, or you are using them right now. It's just a way to express what you want to change and to ask for feedback. Once you make a decision, keep a decision record. You can go back to it. And while this is, these are good practices within a team, you can decide to use them or not. If you go cross teams, they became so important in order to spread the knowledge, to onboard new joiner, and to make sure it's easy to discover why that thing changed at that point. And talking about discovery, I want to talk about the last part uh, in uh, discovery be beyond teams. So within a teams, you go maybe a stand up, you got stand up, someone has still stand up. Uh, you uh, change, you talk with your peers every single day. You may are sitting together. No, actually that doesn't really work anymore. We are maybe re remote, but you are talking a lot within your team. But outside of your team, how are you finding out which other micro frontends do we have? Which other new horizontal micro frontend did we actually added last week or three months ago? So we are using Backstage, which is a quite a, a nice tool from Spotify, uh, which was born with microservices and backend in mind, but it gives you a list, and a list, I'm butchering it, is much more, but starts with a list of microservices or components from your company. And it's quite easy because it offers you an entry point, an entry gate which is standardized across all the teams. You can find out which are the microservices, which are the teams, which are the micro frontends. And that is something which is very invaluable because you may have team confluence pages or team notes spread across, but having a single entry point to ease the discovery is fundamental when you want to have autonomous team, but teams aware of what is happening outside of their remit. Last but not least, sharing code. Sharing code has been huge for us because last time I was on this stage talking about this, we actually said we are duplicating by design, not by accident. By design, we are saying duplicate the header and the footer in three or four places. We were doing that because we were favor autonomy from the team at the cost of visual inconsistency. As per today, three years after, we haven't shared a single visual component across all the micro frontends yet. What does that mean? It means that the decision we took originally was controversial, but didn't change dramatically. So we didn't have that fight back from the actual teams because the ideas and the architecture was not playing nice. But there is a yet, is also in, in white because I wanted your attention to be there because these things were modeled after the zone three years ago, four years ago. We were optimizing, optimizing for autonomy. And uh, that may not be true anymore because right now we are changing priorities for the company. So our code and our um, architecture needs to follow that. So we are sharing something. They may not be visual component uh, across everything, but I wanted to share you to share with you what we are sharing in order to tell you why we did that and why we took the decision to not share something from day one, but to start adding something when needed. First one is payments, highly crucial, critical component. If you work with payments, you know you got, you got PCI audit and a lot of other important things you don't want to do, duplicate your payment part. So we actually are sharing some payment code across two micro frontends. Next one is analytics. We started completely separate, but we were ending up, think about a simple page view event on your favorite analytic tool. A single micro frontend was sending an event shaped in one way, another one in a different way, and when we had to update the event, we needed to talk with all the micro frontend at once. And the reporting was not good. So we said, mm, okay, maybe we need to revisit that. We actually create a small library, you can port it, and it shapes your event that you're sending to, uh, in our case, Google Tag Manager, but pick your favorite one. Last but not least, experiment. I'm sure many of you are using experiment right now to develop features or to enable feature at runtime. But it's really hard that you've got single teams autonomously picking their experimenting tool. Most likely you've got a company tool, um, you, you name it, that you need to use. And we wanted to put that behind an actual abstraction because we were changing those things. And that led to us to create that abstraction as a shared thing across multiple micro frontend. So share if you want, but think about why you are sharing. That is my last slide for today, takeaways. So first of all, think about 
your business, your company, and think that your business subdomains, your company is not immutable, so is your code and your architecture. Go back to your de decision. We started with vertical, we ended up with vertical and horizontal, and it's playing good for us, us to do today. Second one, very important, share as a solution to achieve a goal. Do not share for the goal of sharing. Do not measure the number of shared component for the sake of sharing component. Do that because you think it's valuable. You think it's helping you for, to solve a problem. And at the end, we talk about tech, we talk about architecture, we talk about a lot of things, but the end is about people. We actually scaled, we went to microphone tents to allow people to work better independently, so it's always about people. That was the last slide. Thank you very much. <laughs> You'll find the slides at this URL. Thank you so much, Max. That was a great talk. And you shared so many insightful lessons learned at this one. So thank you so much. Sure.